Hi, everyone. This is Jason Bjork of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. Today's special guest is a returning guest, but I had a lot of listeners asked to have him back on. We had him on about six months ago. He's the co-chief investment officer at Evergreen GAFCAL. He's worked in the securities industry since 1979, so he has a wealth of experience in bull markets, bear markets, Fed rate hikes, Fed rate cuts, all different types of cycles. He's published a finance newsletter since 2005 that now reaches over 15,000 readers, the Haymaker newsletter, and he's the author of The Bubble 3.0, Who Blew It, and How to Protect Yourself When It Blows Apart. David Hay, thank you for joining me again. The pleasure, Jason. So, David, we're recording this interview on Thursday, August 10th, 2023. The dollar index has had a substantial rally the last couple of weeks, up to 102.64%. I listen to a lot of this global macro analysis out there. It seems very heavily U.S. centric. There's a lot of people arguing the U.S. is not officially in a recession yet. We are hearing Goldman Sachs saying there's no recession risk now. The Goldman Sachs PhD economist, in your opinion, is the rest of the global economy outside the U.S. already in a recession, though? Really not all of it. China looks very soft. That's been extremely disappointing, especially given the reopening. Uh, I'd say certain parts of Europe are in recession, but there's parts of Asia that look uh, quite robust and Latin America, South America. So it's quite varied. But if you look at the news just reported by Maersk, which is the huge container shipping company, that certainly looks like there's a global trade recession underway. So perhaps we've got our segments of the global economy and certain nations are in recession. But since you brought that up, I think that you know the people, and it's the majority of people right now, at least the majority of professionals, believe that, just like you said, we've avoided, it's not even just a soft landing, it's now a no landing belief. And I think it's way premature to be making that claim, given the, you know, so much of this is based upon what are the uh, lagging and coincident indicators doing with very little attention to the leading indicators. And Part of that is because people say, well, the leading indicators have been flashing red for quite a while and there's been no actual recession. So that's where I'd say, well, maybe, maybe not. And let's look at earnings, which kind of are important for stock investors. They are clearly in a recession, probably a three quarter recession. And it only takes two to to create an official earnings recession. If we look at manufacturing, little doubt that that's in a recession. Again, pockets of strength, particularly those companies involved in the reindustrialization of America and beneficiaries of the the money tsunami from the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, But then if we look at corporate, or sorry, government tax revenues, they're clearly in recession. I think the one that's the most important of all is GDI. You know, there's so much focus on gross domestic product and very little focus on GDI, gross domestic income. But bright people like Lacey Hunt, David Rosenberg say GDI is actually more accurate, less subject to revision, and uh, our internal at, at GovCal Monetary Export, or one of them, uh, Tax and Tan, is also saying the same thing. And we've got a chart that we can look at here in a bit on that. But uh, I would just say the more I study it, the more I think G- GDI is more important. And kind of a real life test of that is if you look at the first half of last year, we had two negative GDP quarters in a row. A lot of people thought we were in recession, and yet we weren't. And GDI did not show that we were in a uh, recession. But um, one of the charts I said, I know this is audio only, but it is a chart showing the difference between GDI, which has clearly gone negative, and GDP, which is still expanding. And whenever that's happened in the past, we've been right on the verge of a recession. So I, I would say that there should be more focus on GDI and less focus on GDP. Or or the definition of a recession is going to keep changing. We'll have to see what happens. But I think the lag effects after 12 plus months of Federal Reserve Bank rate hikes, and yes, interest rates are not at all time highs or anything like that. However, it was the pace of the rate hikes, especially after about 15 years of the Federal Reserve Bank training asset managers, training corporations that they can expect uh, artificially cheap interest rates near zero interest rate policy. So you had just, I would call it over borrowing, especially from small businesses. Now with the lag effects, David, I think we're starting to see a lot of red flags. So it's not an official recession yet with the government economic data, but we're seeing what a record pace of bankruptcies now. And there's a lot of evidence that appears that the U.S. consumer either is already tapped out or is very, very close to being fully tapped out. Yeah, that's well said. I think that you're exactly right. That's that's why it's important to look at leading indicators, even though the the lag (laughs) with leading indicators varies over time. 
And the, the famous saying is that monetary policy works with long and variable lags, and we are seeing those variable lags. And so I think you're right. I think it's uh, it's just a matter of time. And uh, it, it is amazing if you look at, for example, the Home Builder Index, the XHB ETF, which is basically you know right there at an all-time high. It looks to me like a double top. But it's pretty remarkable given what's happened to interest rates, affordability, which of course is terrible, volumes which are coming down. I'm convinced that there's another shoe to drop in the housing market and that we're going to see uh, that XHB line come down. That's one of my actual favorite personal shorts or hedges. But for your listeners who probably don't buy puts or go short, they may have some housing stocks that they might want to be taking some profits on because I just don't see how that stays up here. Just anecdotally, we live in a very fast growing, nice neighborhood. We're in a perfect location right on the Washington border, Washington state, uh, right next to Idaho. And there's no state income tax in Washington. And the cost of living is so much less here than it is in the Seattle area. So this is, and it has been a very dynamic area, but it's just shocking to me to see how many homes are now on the market here. Last year, there was almost nothing. And these homes, for the most part, aren't selling. And actually, the same is true where we have our other place uh, over on Lake Coeur d'Alene, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, which was absolutely the hottest real estate market uh, back in 2021, jumped 40% in one year. And that's turned into a disaster. And, you know, that's kind of anecdotal, but I think you're going to hear more and more anecdotes along those lines. I think I heard in those areas that the governments, the local governments have started to rapidly raise property taxes. So that could be part of it that the residents uh, don't want to pay property taxes. But from a residential real estate standpoint, I mean, if you have a mortgage and you locked it in a few years ago, a 30 year mortgage at 3%, I mean, a lot of people from what I'm hearing, and this is anecdotal, they don't want to sell their their house or their luxury condo that they locked in a mortgage on at 3%. Uh, they don't want to go and buy something uh, with a much higher mortgage. That's well, actually absolutely true. That's one reason why the market's kind of frozen. And that's why I'm also surprised to see so many homes for sale in our neighborhood, because presumably a lot of these people did lock in at you know very low rates during the collapse uh, after COVID. So, but something's got to give because you've got to have transaction volume, you've got to have market clearing prices. And I don't think these prices that people are asking for their homes are enough. And so it could be that people say, well, you know, yeah, my mortgage payment is going to go up a lot. But on the other hand, I'm able to make a 20 or 30 percent profit that will cover the uh, the increased mortgage costs. But that's assuming they can get those higher prices, which I don't think in most cases they'll be able to do. But I do think that they're, we're going to see this logjam eventually break. And I think what's going to break is going to be prices and prices coming down you know, relatively drastically. I think there's just more distortions from the governments because some of these governments have been rapidly raising property taxes the last 18 to 24 months. We're also seeing, I don't know if you've seen this the last month or so, I'm starting to see stories again. And it's like, oh no, this is reminding me again of 2005, 2006, 2007 is a big spike in home equity loans, I guess, because credit card interest rates are so high. Yeah, hey, you've got over a trillion dollars of credit card debt that's uh, where the interest rate is over 20%. An amazing factoid is that Credit card interest rates are actually higher today than they were uh, in the early 80s when Volcker took the prime rate over 20%. I wow. find that absolutely wow. astounding, but it's true. I've got all kinds of data on that. Yeah, and we had an increase in credit card debt by about, I think, 15% year over year. So that's something that not a lot of people are talking about. That might be the real inflation rate. So if you adjusted consumer spending over the last 12 months for uh, the CPI, actually, it's that um, the consumer spending is actually falling off a cliff if you adjust it for inflation. So the consumer spending, so everyone's pointing to like the nominal amount of consumer spending, saying consumers are still spending. Well, it's really the gap. The difference there is the amount of inflation. So people have had to uh, pay a higher price to maintain their standard of living because of the bills going up. Yeah, exactly. To your point, uh, Michael Hartnett from B of A, he's very bright, just put a factoid out there that Real, so to your point, of inflation adjusted retail sales are down 1.6% year over year. And that's another thing that only happens leading up to a recession. I mean, really right on the edge of a recession. That's why I just see so many things that only happen at the outset of a recession that are happening now. And yet you've got the consensus that's doing this victory dance that, oh, yeah, we, you know, we've avoided it. And, and you know, the way the financial markets work is that there's just, there's so many knuckleballs that are thrown the way of the consensus. And once everybody gets convinced of something, you better be prepared for the opposite. 
Oh, I totally agree. And the red flags that we've seen this week, and well, the, it had started to come out last week with the Fed survey of the senior executives at banks saying that they were going to drastically tighten credit. But then we've had the Moody's downgrades of some of the small and medium sized regional banks. So drastically tightening credit, normally that's what a precursor is that a leading indicator for a recession? Absolutely. Uh, that's a very important leading indicator. And you raise a good point that hasn't got enough press, which are these downgrades, these credit downgrades and the spread widening that's happening to the uh, the bank bonds. So that's you know disturbing. It's contrary, frankly, to what's happening with the bond market overall, because to give you know proper credit to the bullish argument or the soft landing, no landing argument is that credit spreads are actually quite tight right now. I mean, they're not super, super tight, but they're on the tighter end of neutral. Uh, looking at the junk bond spreads at somewhere around 420, I didn't look today, but you know, they were over 600 last year. And that's when we thought there was a pretty darn good value with some of the high grade uh, junk bonds, not to be too uh, too much of a, using a too much of an oxymoron. But the other, of course, and this actually relates to one of the things we talked about last time. Uh, you know, I felt like this was really a pretty good call, which was I my number one fear for the second half of 2023 was that we would have a, what I call the 4F scenario, a federal fiscal funding fiasco. And that really came home to roost here week before last. And it was kind of obscured by the pitch downgrade of the US credit rating. But at the same time, the treasury drastically increased how much debt they have to raise in the second half of the year, which is now 1.85 trillion. Now realize that's in six months. Now, some of that for sure is because of the debt ceiling uh, standoff where they couldn't get the financing through and the treasury drew down its checking account called the TGA. But most of it is just new money. And it's also pretty shocking the lack of interest in rolling over treasury debt in the first half of the year where there was about a $2 trillion shortfall. Uh, my point is, I think you're really running the risk of some kind of buyer strike or at least buyers just being overwhelmed by this onslaught of supply because of these massive deficits. And it's just, it's unprecedented for the government to be running deficits that are you know, 7%, 8% of GDP when you've got in unemployment below four, unemployment basically at an all time low. That's just shockingly bad. And so if we do get a recession, what's gonna happen is the, the, the debt deluge is gonna become even worse. And the, the potential to overwhelm the number of buyers out there becomes even a greater risk. And it's going to put more pressure on the Fed, which right now, as you know, is selling. So they're in quantitative tightening mode. So they're creating even more supply. So I mean, this is just like this huge train wreck that's staring us right in the face that hardly anybody's talking about. And yet we're seeing more and more evidence that that is what's going to happen. And it is interesting that, I don't know if you, you knew this, I didn't know until I read this just the other day, that when S&P downgraded uh, the U.S. government in 2011, Two weeks later, the CEO of S&P was fired. So I think the Fitch CEO might want to be checking his golden parachute. <laughs> the The other thing you brought up a few minutes ago earlier in the interview was the government tax receipts. I think, what, three quarters in a row are already falling. So if that trend continues, didn't the Fed, one of the real reasons for quantitative easing, not the public reasons the Fed gave, one of the real reasons back in 2008, 2009, and again in 2020 with the Fed expanding balance sheet was to plug the hole between all the government budgets at all levels of government and the tax receipts. So if we have a huge gap between the tax receipts being collected, if they're falling off a cliff and the government doesn't want to cut back spending, won't the Fed have to be the buyer last resort of the treasuries to fund these uh, ridiculous government spending deficits? Well, I think ultimately you're right. And, and that actually leads to a term that I think we're going to hear more and more of in upcoming months and years, and that's called fiscal dominance. And what that really means is that the, the, the need to finance the federal government becomes the dominant policy for the Fed, whether they admit it or not. Now, right now, they're clearly going the opposite direction. And one of my renegade predictions is that before that happens, before this, the Fed has to restart what I call its magical money machine, which is what was doing all the QEs, uh, I think Jay Powell will resign. I, I don't think he will do that. I'm, in fact, I'm convinced he won't do that on his watch. He already did enough enabling in the past, and particularly in 2019. I mean, that's when they really, in a you know, relatively good economy out of the blue, they were forced to get back into, you know, I called it really QE4 at that point, 
uh, which is when there was the repo crisis. So, and you could argue in a way that they kind of did that this year in the spring when those three banks went down and they did the uh, long-term bank funding facility, whatever they called it, which basically was a kind of a stealth form of, of QE, but now they, they're reversing that. So they're back to selling at a fairly healthy clip. Something's got to give. I mean, this is just an unsustainable situation. And again, Wall Street, I mean, I listen to CNBC all the time. I almost never hear anything about that. That the, uh, the the big treasury funding blowout number that came out week before last, they got a little bit of press, but not nearly as much as it deserved. But we're going to hear more and more of it about it. Yeah, the mainstream financial media is repeating stock market, bull market, small correction. No one's talking about how in financial history, at least I can't find an example of a stock market, bull market in the U.S. with with an inverted yield curve, uh, with banks tightening credit, you know, all these red flags here. And CNBC is just bull market, bull market, bull market. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, the, I think one of the great canaries in the coal mine, that, or maybe just wrong way, Corrigan contraindicator is Jim Cramer. And he was saying back last month that you should just keep buying the Magnuson 7, you know, those famous seven names, mega cap tech names. And he said, it's just so easy. And when he said, and I even wrote this up in my newsletter at the time. And so when it, when any anybody says, especially with this high profile, that it's just so easy to do whatever X, you usually want to go the other way. And ironically, since he said that, and since I wrote it up and it actually put out a, you know, like I said, it was like heresy. Uh, that I actually downgraded the QQQ to an outright sell down or short if you were aggressive looking for a hedge. And ironically, it is down about 4%. I know it's not very long. It's not that big a decline. But what I am seeing is a lot of these very aggressive names are starting to get crushed, the ones that went up so much throughout uh, most of this year. Uh, it looks like things are turning. And it feels to me kind of like what happened in the fourth quarter 2021 when a lot of those, because you know, I really think 2021 was peak insanity in the financial markets. Now, that's the year that we had the meme stocks go nuts. And that's when Dogecoin got up to an $88 billion market cap, even though it's worthless. And the NFTs and the SPACs. And you know, there's been trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars destroyed, even with this, what I call echo bubble that we've had this year. And so there was a lot of pain starting to be felt in 2021. And I, I think we're starting to see that happening now. And as you point out, some of these things just are not consistent with an ongoing bull market, much less an echo bubble. So I totally agree with what you just said. I think the other thing that happened last week, too, was the miss that Apple had. So I think their total sales amount, the revenues were fine, but people were looking at the amount of iPhone sales and I've had discussions at like the cell phone carrier, the telecoms, like at a T-Mobile store. And they were actually shocked that I paid up front, you know, all cash um, Well, on my debit card. I paid up front for my phone, my new phone, because almost everyone from speaking to the employees there, everyone's paying on credit. Everyone's paying a higher monthly payment there. So I guess that was going on for years. And with interest rates where they are, people's credit card debt and credit card interest rates, that seems no longer feasible. So I would say that my educated guess would be that that would, might be one of the reasons why Apple did not hit the numbers on the iPhone sale because so many people uh, over the years have been buying new iPhones with uh, credit and higher monthly payments. And, and we got to a point now with credit card debt and interest rates that is basically just breaking those people who are not affluent uh, to be able to buy new iPhones. Right. And I think a lot of big ticket items too. And you know that is one of the sad things that so much of this debt has been added on for you know, things which are consumable. I mean, it's one thing if you borrow money to buy an asset that actually is going to provide a positive return. Although if you're paying 20%, it's pretty hard to find an asset that's going to cover that cost of carry. So it's a, it's a disaster. And as you know, student loans now, they're going to be, uh, they're going to go back into where you have to start paying interest on them, the borrowers do. And that's going to be another hit. It's just a lot of things are adding up. But I think the raging bulls are ignoring to their own peril. So yes, I, I think, and then we've got interest, I'm sorry, oil prices that have, they were down today, but uh, they're up 20% over the last uh, five, six weeks. And that was basically going back to a time when Jim Cramer was saying, why did you want, why would you want to buy Exxon? Because they are, they make a, produce a commodity that's falling in price. And he pretty much hit the bottom with that. So, uh, you know, gasoline prices are soaring around the country. Diesel prices are up like 39%. And of course, energy is such a, so pervasive within the economy that when that cost goes up, 
that starts to hit people, pretty amazing correlation between inflation expectations and the price of oil. So I do think that we're going to get some, even though the inflation number today was, was pretty good, I think we're going to see some, but basically I think there's going to be a second wave of inflationary pressures. I mean, you look at what companies like Pepsi are doing, a 15% price increase. And a lot of these consumer products companies are still increasing prices at double digit rates now, not in the past, not just in the past, but now. We just got a bill from our we have kind of a poor man concierge doctor, and he just raised his prices 20%. And, you know, we're going to pay it. You look at what's happening with insurance, which I think is really underappreciated. You were kind of talking about, you were talking about property taxes earlier, but also these insurance rates going up so drastically, uh, which is kind of this lag inflation type of hit, you know, as they incur all these rising claims and costs of the claims that you know, then they start boosting premiums. And for a lot of people, th- those are, that's a big deal. They have, say, your homeowner's insurance go from $3,000 a year to $5,000 a year. So if you have to buy a new car, and particularly if you're not going to pay cash, you got to finance it. The, the financing rates have gone up drastically. So it's, I think there's lots of potential for disappointment, but maybe I'm just too old and cynical. I've been doing this, as you said, a very long time since Jimmy Carter was in the White House. Yeah, I completely agree that the uh, consumer price index is not accounting for for the insurance costs going up. I think for healthcare insurance, they only measure on the consumer price index, Medicare and Medicaid reimbursements, which for the average person out there who's an American, that doesn't cover, it doesn't reflect anything about reality for their medical bills. I, I'm just hearing anecdotal stories from lots of people how they've had to trade down for their healthcare insurance plans. And the worst healthcare insurance plan is more money than their old plan, which was better. Right. Well, I think that's very true. Yeah. So you know, another thing. This is this is diverging a little bit, but you were talking about the difference between nominal sales and, and real sales. And I guess a bit of a twist on that that I just really don't hear is when you look at GDP and again, nominal GDP. So that includes inflation. You know, it's running at about six percent. But just think about this. To get six percent nominal GDP, we're running deficits of seven to eight percent of GDP. I and mean, how healthy is that? So you back that out, we're actually contracting anyway. So it's. It's another one of those head scratchers in, in my mind. Yeah, plus base effects, what is using a deflator too? So that's not even using what the, the CPI inflation rate. I mean, there's a bunch of stuff in there that's gobbledygook. There's a lot of adjustments in there too with the, um, you have the headline number for the consumer price index that doesn't reflect food prices or insurance costs or any of the stuff that people's regular bills are increasing a lot. Yeah, so I did a podcast here recently with Peter Schiff and well, if you want to hear somebody with a negative take on inflation, that's the guy to talk to. He thinks it's drastically understated. And I've seen, you know, these charts that show, well, what if they hadn't made all the changes? I think it was in the early 80s or mid 80s where the, the Fed adjusted its CPI calculation. And inflation would be running much, much higher. And I, I was a believer that we were going to see some disinflation because commodity prices came went up so high and came down so fast. That made sense to me that you get some disinflation. But we've had that. And now it's starting to turn the other way. And you still got kind of these residual inflationary impulses that are working their way through the economy, like I described. And so I just I don't think we're going to get to two or three percent sustainable inflation anytime soon. Now, if we get a really bad recession, then maybe inflation does cool down. So kind of my best guess right now is we're going to get a flare up in inflation again. The recession is going to hit. I don't think it's going to be a baby recession like some people. I think it's going to be a fairly severe recession. Inflation could well come down again at that point, but a longer term, I think that the, we're more like in the 1970s, where you did have inflation cool during recessions, and then it would shoot back up again because of the underlying structural inflationary forces, which is what I think we have now with reshoring, reindustrialization, the greenflation thing, which is just huge. You now, the cost of the great green energy transition, the amount of money that's being spent on the Inflation Reduction Act, and now, there's some good aspects, but whenever you get the government that involved in spending so much money so quickly, you know there's going to be a tremendous amount of malinvestment. So anyway, bottom line, I think we're in a structural and inflationary period where there'll be some brief respites. Actually, I wanted to ask you about the 1970s, since you were a financial professional back then about mm-hmm. inflation and waves and Arthur, what the, the narrative is that Arthur Burns thought he had inflation beat and then he stopped with the interest rate hikes. So inflation paused, what, for a couple of years and then it started again. There was another wave. Do you expect something similar could happen based on Fed policy 
or the lack of supply and investment in commodities and energy or wages going up, things like that? Yes, in some ways, I think it's worse. I mean, I think we've got a more endemic in, uh, energy shortage now than we did then. I mean, that was basically kind of artificial, the, the, the embargoes that happened in 1973, four, and then in late 70s, kind of 78, 79. But this one is, this one's really, to use that word again, structural. And, and the reason I say that is that it relates to the great green energy transition. There's just such hostility towards fossil fuels and so much pressure on these companies not to invest in their business, both for ESG reasons and also for Wall Street reasons, where Wall Street doesn't want them to to put a ton of money into new wells, unlike what we did from, say, 2005 to 2020, which, I mean, this, just think about this. I don't remember we talked about it last time, but it's an amazing uh, reality to consider is that basically in that period of time, the United States created three Saudi Arabias, one in oil and two in natural gas. So we basically had an increase of about 30 million barrels a day of production equivalent between oil and natural gas. I mean, a little bit less than that, uh, you know, probably 9 million barrels a day on, on the oil side. And then you know, just, you know, we went from building all these LNG facilities to bring natural gas in. And then we've uh, converted them over at great expense so that they're now export facilities. The U.S. is the largest exporter of natural gas. And well, who knew that? But that was simply a function of the shale miracle, which, of course, is detested, I think, very stupidly. We could get into why I think, frankly, both China and Russia have had enormous influence on the anti-fossil fuel, anti-nuclear movement, both of those. And I don't know, did you see the front page New York Times article over the weekend on this very topic? No, what was, what was it about? It is one of the most amazing. I'm writing it up in my uh, newsletter, both tomorrow, kind of touching on it, then going to go into it in detail on Monday. And by the way, that Monday newsletter is still about half of it's free for all your readers that want a freebie to kind of check us out, Haymaker at Substack, a little brief commercial message. But this it's this front page expose. It's almost like a Woodward Bernstein on Watergate type of expose on what's happened with these uh, wealthy, this guy that sold his software company for $785 million. And he's a very aggressive funder of progressive causes, and they've tied him totally to the Chinese government. You know, all kinds of different connections to China. And so he's naturally, you know, financing these anti-capitalism, anti-fossil fuel, anti-nuclear, anything that's basically anti, you know, the welfare of the United States, because obviously China wants to see us in a very weakened position. Of course, they foment a lot of social discontent. So I think that finally we're starting to wake up to how we've been manipulated to be so anti-energy. At the same time, that coal that uh, China's building a new coal facility, they're building about two new coal facilities every week, uh, and even Europe has been burning a ton of coal and a ton of wood, as a matter of fact. And it's uh, you know, and here we think by going to EVs in the United States, we're going to have an impact when the developing world is not going to do that at all. They're going full bore with uh, with both nuclear and with with fossil fuels and with you know some degree of renewables, but. China, it just absolutely has a stranglehold on renewables, and they've also become the largest exporter of EVs. So that's another industry that they're going to dominate, just like they did with solar panels. And I think they're going to try to do that with nuclear power plant construction, you know, where they've really got this down to a science, where they just kind of stamp these things out almost in an assembly line way and start doing those for other countries around the world while we you know, have to spend what... Uh, over $10, $10 billion per gigawatt, if you look at the most recent plan. So anyway, I, I just think there's been a tremendous manipulation of the Western mindset by China and Russia, but hopefully we're waking up. I think the U.S. has terrible um, energy grid, the electrical grid infrastructure, and then also like all the charging stations. I don't think we could do a mass switch to electric vehicles it's just not there the electrical grid the current electrical grid that the us ha has cannot handle it and yet we see what congress or the white house announced an infrastructure plan to supposedly fix this and it seems like every i don't know four to four to eight years there's a new infrastructure bill and then nothing actually gets fixed about improving the um electrical grid infrastructure 
You're absolutely right. That's one of my pet peeves. I keep saying that the fragility of the grid and it's going to become more fragile as we put more and more demands on it. And the problem is you just can't build new transmission lines. It is unbelievably difficult to put in new transmission lines. I mean, what they could do is some of these retired coal facilities, you know, be putting in, uh, I would think it makes more sense to put in these small modular reactors at these old coal sites where they actually are connected to the grid already, but the grid's overloaded and it's going to get worse. So that's a very good point. And it's one of the many flaws with the great green energy transition. And that's one of the beauties of SMR, small modular reactors, it's really distributed power. You can have these small little plants located, let's say, in a military base or in a city. And you know, these things are walk away safe. They're nothing like the big, expensive, and you know, sometimes dangerous light water reactors. But our, you know, we seem to lack much in the way of vision, though you know, I, I do agree or I do believe that the Department of Energy has become much more pro-nuclear. There's there's uh, billions of dollars being allocated to nuclear out of the IRA, and even the you know the Jobs Act before from 2021 had six billion dollars allocated for nuclear. So maybe just because of necessity, nuclear is finally coming out from behind the moon. It's been a long, long eclipse. You actually had a, a great discussion um, on your YouTube channel. It didn't get the views it deserves a month ago. You had on an expert about a new type of advanced nuclear power technology, what is a thorium battery. And then you also talked about the future of next generation nuclear power technology with the liquid fluoride molten salt thorium reactors. Yes, yes, I did have that. And, you know, might say that my podcast and my newsletters never get enough views, Jason. And that's just a reality. But it was also Doomberg was on there, who, of course, is legendary in our business and is becoming more so with every passing day. So it was both Doomberg and a gentleman by the name of Richard McPherson, who's an ex-Navy nuke guy, used to work on a rickover. He's been involved in nuclear energy for you know, 50, I think 55 years now. And and he's got a bunch of his uh, ex-Navy nuke guys in there with him. And so it, if you listen to people that are know way more about this than I do, like Adam Rodman, who's a great source, Jason Hune, you'll hear they talk about Gen 4 nuclear reactors. And, and that really means what you were just describing, these molten salt reactors. Now, the thorium is a trickier part. I think ultimately that'll happen. Thorium is more plentiful. Uh, but really, the problem isn't uranium cost because the cost is such a small part of the overall operation of the plant. So even if it doubled or tripled, really wouldn't make much difference. Uh, but the process itself is critical. And I do think the molten salt, which was actually perfected, proven by Oak Ridge National Laboratory uh, in the 60s under the leadership of a brilliant guy, Alvin Weinberg. I just finished his bio autobiography. And it was uh, you know pretty sad. At the end of his life, he was looking at the nuclear industry being in utter disarray and you know, basically being shut down in the United States. And he felt way back when that by going with light water reactors, the kind that had trouble at Three Mile Island, and then, of course, Fukushima now. Terminal in Ukraine was a completely different situation. I mean, they didn't even have a containment dome on, dome on that. But nonetheless, Weinberg warned in the early 70s that while it's very unlikely there could be a catastrophic event at a light water reactor, and that would be much safer to go with molten salt reactors, but there was so much momentum and money behind light water reactors at that point, including the Navy, because these Navy I mean, just think about the Navy submarines and, and aircraft carriers that had nuclear propulsion going back to the 60s. In fact, actually, the late 50s, I like think the Nautilus submarine was late 50s. Again, Rick Over got that to happen. That's light water. Now, they're small light water reactors, but they're light water. They're not molten salt. And I, I don't think there's any question that molten salt is, salt is a much safer way to generate atomic energy. Yeah, unfortunately, with a lot of energy policy, and I've written about this in articles over the years, too, there's just not free markets with that, especially with nuclear power. So there's all these regulatory agencies and, and red tape and permitting fees and things could be delayed a decade or more. To, uh, it's uh, literally a nightmare here in the United States now just to get one or two nuclear power plants built. Absolutely. I mean, just look at those vocal plants that finally have come online. They're supposed to be $14 billion. They came at $30 billion, but they That's started... In, two, in the early 70s is when it was the, the whole process initially be, began. Uh, and I believe, you can double check me on this, I believe it was right before the NRC was actually established. The only one that, that the NRC approved that got built was Watts Bar in Tennessee. You know, again, double check me, but I'm pretty sure that's accurate. 
So, yeah, that's why I joke and not really much of a joke that the NRC should have an A in front of it for anti-nuclear regulatory commission. So you think then that the the demand growth for nuclear power, for uranium and nuclear power, is going to come from outside the United States then? Well, I think there's going to be some in the U.S. and it will likely accelerate given the change in sentiment toward it. And particularly with these, I mean, you've got Bill Gates with Terra Power. That's a small modular reactor you've got now. Uh, Sam Altman with ChatGBT, the, you know, the founder of ChatGBT, that's got his SMR, uh, which is Oclo, and he's just merged that into a SPAC with an $850 million valuation. Now, my my buddies, uh, that's Richard McPherson and his crew, they're operating on a shoestring. They think they can get this done for, you know, get one operating with a very important uh, national lab for like $20 million. But somebody's going to break the code. I just think I believe in American ingenuity enough. And, you know, there's enough focus on this by brilliant people. It's going to happen. But that's speculative. What's not speculative is to look around the world and say there's 60 new nuclear reactors under construction right now, 20 of which, of course, are in China. And the problem that I mean, this is, I think, the investment opportunity, but it is a problem for the, the users is that there isn't enough uranium at these prices. Now, prices go high enough. Then there, you know, there's a lot of uranium. You probably just saw that the Biden administration is sequestering a, a million acres in northern Arizona that is supposedly the most prolific uranium deposit in the U.S. for environmental reasons, which is what makes the, his family's involvement with these uh, you know, investments in uranium. I think Uranium One is the company, of, and in, particularly in Kazakhstan. I'm saying that right. Am I saying that right? I, you, you even know the name of the company. What is it? Kazakh Prom or something? Kazata Prom. Thank you. <clears throat> anyway, they're, you know, Hunter is heavily involved. There are all kinds of evidence coming out about that. So that doesn't smell too great. But I, I have a feeling that you know, the main reason was for environmental considerations, whatever. You know, I mean, maybe that's the right thing to do environmentally. It's kind of around the Grand Canyon, but it's just a fact that it's going to make the shortage of uranium even more acute. And if it gets acute enough, I think that's when thorium you know, becomes a more viable option. But I don't know enough about this, but the people that I trust and have, you know, that do have the steep knowledge think that thorium is kind of like fusion. I don't think it's quite as far off as fusion, but it doesn't sound like it's any imminent just because there's such a big ecosystem in place for processing uranium. But I mean, they, I do know at Oak Ridge, they were able to get, you know, thorium to work as a fuel and and I do know that, uh, you know, the molten salt is kind of fuel agnostic. They'll they'll use whatever makes sense. So I'm, I'm optimistic. I think this is going to be a huge breakthrough for humanity. But uh, we got to we got to quit letting ourselves be duped and played for idiots by these foreign powers that are, you know, hate what we stand for. They've been doing this for a century. I think we're at least probably a decade away from more breakthroughs with the liquid fluoride molten salt thorium reactor reactor. I mean, if the governments had been more pro-research and development, they would have already started on this decades ago for allowing what better pilot plant facilities besides the one in the 1960s, but they blocked it for decades. Um, when the technology is working as it should, if people go and watch the Thorium Remix videos, I mean, it can recycle old nuclear weapons. It can recycle old nuclear fuel rods, because that's kind of what the people who are anti-nuclear power say is it creates all this nuclear uh, nuclear waste, there's nuclear weapons, and so the liquid fluoride molten salt thermal reactor would eventually be able to recycle all this and there would be very little waste left over and it would only be for about 100 years. So um, and then it wouldn't be radioactive anymore. That's exactly right. That's, uh, that's an excellent point. It's one that my buddy Richard McPherson made in the, the podcast with Doomberg is that we need to shift our mindset instead of looking at this, this uh, collection, this accumulation of nuclear waste that we do have stored around the country, I, I think in most cases close to where the actual reactors are. You know, we've never put anything in Yucca, which is ridiculous, frankly. It's you know, that's another story. But but Richard's point is exactly what he said is that we should look at it as an asset, not a liability, because these new generation nuclear reactors can reprocess that fuel. And they they have worn it for 10 years, whereas a typical light water reactor after about 18 months, they have to replace the, you know, replenish the fuel. So it's you're right. If the government got behind this, which is like what happened with Germany, you know, during last year's uh, cutoff of Russian energy, is you know we thought it would be a decade or more until they got enough LNG importing facilities. And when they had their back against the wall, I mean, they were doing these temporary things offshore. I mean, that was just if if you're in a dire enough situation, it's amazingly amazing how creative you can get. But we haven't had that kind of 
you know, kind of Apollo moonshot type of mentality with nuclear energy, which, you know, maybe now that's coming. And I'm just hoping and praying these guys can prove it and prove how safe this technology really is and how effective it is. But you know, as you said, it, I mean, this was going on back in the 1960s. It's it's not that it it's it's major breakthrough stuff, but it has been fairly significantly enhanced. Uh, at least that's what these guys uh, have convinced me they've done. Well, there needs to be more research and development dollars because I've seen uh, Kirk Sorensen talk about this. So the, there's some issues with scaling up the size of the facility. They want what they wanted to do was to be able to crank out un, for under a hundred million dollars these smaller liquid fl- fluoride molten salt thorium reactors, and then put them so they could power a city at small level scale. So the the reactors then would be kind of be able to mostly be fabricated in a factory. And then it would drastically reduce the cost and it would be basically uniform rather than these customized jobs uh, for a lot of these white wa- light water reactors that end up be, uh, costing billions of dollars, like the the amount of extra time, the amount of extra capital for construction cost overruns. I think you said what it was projected at 14 billion in, in it a came out of 30. <laughs> yeah, it came yeah out of 30. I mean, if it's you're a little investor, over budget. Yeah. So if you're well, and the taxpayer is going to get punished, but if you're the construction company, uh, you're, that's probably good for you. You can overcharge, but if you're an investor, you're screwed. Well, Westinghouse went broke over it. I think some of the subcontractors made a killing, but uh, you know that's a long, complicated story. How some of these fixed price contracts got put in place, and GE kind of led that uh, led down that garden path back in the mid '60s with unrealistic pricing, but. I mean, the utilities do have to take some of the blame because it's like each utility wanted to have its own, you know, special design. And it's always really, it's the opposite of what these uh, small modular reactors can do, which is, I mean, they can literally be pumped out on an assembly line, you know, at a facility and then shipped because they're small, hence the name. Some were actually really micro reactors, but to kind of go with your logic, if you look at a gigawatt plant, which is basically your standard light water reactor, and you know, let's say that costs ten billion, uh, and that's enough to power a city of about five hundred thousand American homes. It would be more in other countries that don't use as much power. So, if you go from a gigawatt down to a uh, hundred a hundred megawatts, you know, you would say, well, that should only cost you know maybe a billion dollars. And then you go down to say five thousand or so if you're at 5,000 watts, I guess it would be 500 megawatts. Now I'm getting my, my math wrong. So it'd be like 10, 10 megawatts. Anyway, it's basically around $70 million to provide enough power to, for a city of about 5,000 people. So it's, it's not at all, and it should come down as you get economies of scale and, and actually better proficiencies and you know, just the learning curve, it should come down. You know, fairly drastically, which is not the case when you've been doing all these customized ones with all these cost overruns and increased regulations and so forth. So, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if you get these things down to in a you know thirty forty million dollar per unit again for a city of about five thousand people, and then you know be able to locate it close to that city would be a huge advantage because of the eliminating those grid problems that you mentioned earlier. Yeah, I actually had a discussion uh, pretty shortly after Fukushima Wall was playing out about how there were a lot of warning signs with Tokyo Electric Power and the cost overruns and the corners that were cut during construction and and all the waste, fraud, corruption and abuse with that with Japanese nuclear power plants. So there was actually engineers during the construction process who were actually predicting eventually that type of stuff was going to happen at some point with what the, the combination of earthquake, tsunami and then like the backup power systems. Uh, were not properly uh, designed. Well, that's absolutely true. Apparently, they ignored all kinds of safety warnings. And, but it was also, I mean, literally a perfect storm. But anyway, you know, to, to, to correct what I was stumbling through there, but it's about 10 megawatts is what you need for a city of about 5,000 people. And and that's what these things can provide. And again, to be able to crank these them out in volume and, and, and decreasing prices is, I think, very powerful as long as the regulators don't absolutely destroy the process. And you know, that's a, a big risk, a big impediment.
Yeah, I agree. But I think nuclear power does have a bright future, but I, I wouldn't be speculating on a ton of these uranium junior mine stocks because the low cost producers say your Cameco's, your Kazataproms, they have additional low cost mines that they could bring back online fairly quickly. So I wouldn't go out and buy a bunch of these uranium juniors. I'd be very careful with those. I think the Vancouver mining industry is very good at marketing those. But if the larger lowest cost producers want to increase supply, uh, that could flood the market with supply 10 years from now. But there's actually a bottleneck here. Unfortunately, with all these policy blunders, we have the major bottleneck. We we're discussing this before we start recording. The U.S. doesn't have any domestic, any sizable domestic uranium enrichment. So that's the major problem there. And, um, you know, I think the free market could easily solve this. But I think the policymakers for energy policy uh, don't want to allow the free market to fix this problem. Yeah, I think if you have a NIMBY issue with transmission lines, you've really got one when it comes to nuclear enrichment. I mean, where are you going to put that? I guess you, you would think someplace in the Nevada desert, but that's what Yucca is. And that's just a repository. And that's been a huge battle. I mean, it's just, it's another problem with the great green energy transition. Forget uranium. What about cobalt and nickel and copper and you know, trying to build a new mine anywhere that's domestic instead of always having to rely on foreign sources for these essential you know, ingredients, if you will, it's just it's it doesn't make sense. It's like you've got these environmental forces that are exactly opposing each other. You know, we need to have copper, we need to have lithium, but we can't have the the mines. So do you keep importing it and then make yourself more, you know, at the mercy of these uh, entities that are against everything we stand for? Yeah, I completely agree. So to to add the most recent example, I think the Department of Energy just added copper to the critical metals list, but it's a nightmare in most states here in the United States to get a copper mine approved. So basically, that means for the U.S. government adding copper to the strategic metals list, yeah, they want to stockpile copper, maybe build warehouses like China does, but they don't want to allow any actual mines here to be approved. Precisely. It's just nonsensical thinking. I, I guess if you work in D.C., if you work at a regulatory agency, two plus two does not equal four. <laughs> no, it equals four billion. Or uh, stock or five options. Billion or... Or, or stock options on a bus company, an electric bus company that you cash out of two years beforehand before they go bankrupt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the amount of corruption in Washington is by both parties. It's not fair just to point at any one party, but. I do think the stuff that's coming out right now about what the Biden family has been involved with is is pretty shocking. Oh, it's it's happening, too, at the lower levels of government. I mean, we were discussing this before I started recording about the Wall Street Journal article about the, the corruption in the Department of Energy, how the lawyers there in their oversight and ethics branch saying there's rampant examples of insider trading on shares, but no one's going to get charged with any felonies. They were just basically wagging their finger at them. Stop doing it. It's unethical. <laughs> Right. No, it's a mess. And then, you know, you just put all the stuff together and it goes, is this, is this really the, the kinds of material that bull markets are made of? You know, a very real fiscal funding crisis and an inflation problem that is not, not going to go easily into the night. And, and yet valuations, I mean, if you look at the equity risk premium, so you compare the, the earnings yield basically on the S&P 500 to what you can get on treasuries and it's you know the worst it's been since 2007, and that was a rather dangerous time for stocks. And I just uh, I just kind of shake my head at all the crazy stuff going on right now. And as I say, I, I'm really convinced what we've had here recently. I didn't come up with this term. I just heard it and thought this is perfect. Is it's an echo bubble. So um, looking at U.S. government finances and bad policies, is that why you think that uh, non-G7 central banks are not large net buyers of U.S. treasuries? Because uh, they can earn a quote-unquote risk-free yield over 4%, and yet a lot of these non-G7 central banks, the ones that still have trade surpluses, are buying gold tonnage. I think the People's Bank of China is buying 10, 20 tons of physical gold every month, and a lot of these other central banks outside the G7 are too. Yes, for sure. That has definitely been going on. And so kind of a di divestment of treasuries by, you know, the ultimate blue whales in the financial world, and then a reallocation into gold. And actually, our Louis Goff, my great partner's father, Charles, who's 80 years old, just wrote a great piece that 
uh, basically the central banks in the world have the wrong assets on their balance sheets because they're still heavily skewed toward U.S. treasuries, which uh, is my, I don't know if you've ever talked to or know of Simon Mikhailovich. He's a brilliant, brilliant guy. And he calls U.S. Treasury bonds candy wrappers. And he's right. I mean, they can just churn these things out at the trillions. And, you know, it's I, I know that the normal playbook, and believe me, I've advocated it for 40 of my 44 years in the business, almost, you know, with the out exception, there are a few times when I would think that Treasury bonds were going to go down or pricing up and yield. But for most of that period from 1981 until 2020, 2000, so basically 40 years, I was a bond bull with just a few exceptions. But so normally, this is the perfect time to be extending duration, which is not human nature. When the yield curve is inverted, and I've heard this so many times from people that should know better, is why would I want to go out and buy a 10 year treasury yielding four when I can get a one year treasury yielding five and a half? Well, the reason is because you get into a recession, the Fed cuts rates down to almost zero, or in the old days, they would go from, say, 10 to 5, and your yield would go away very quickly. And if you locked in to that higher yield, even though it was lower, you would have it for longer, and you would typically get price appreciation. That's the standard late cycle, you know, right on the edge of a recession type of thing. Extend duration, give up yield to do it. I don't think it makes sense to do that this time because... There's just going to be this overwhelming amount of supply, and a lot of it's going to be on the longer term part of the curve. So I get the appeal of kind of the short to intermediate treasuries, but I think if you really want to capture yield and appreciation, you should do it in countries that have, first of all, much higher yields and better fiscal and monetary policies, and that would be the emerging market countries. But you have to be selective. I mean, you don't want to go to Turkey. You don't want to go to Argentina, but Brazil, Mexico, Indonesia, India, I mean, there's a long list of countries that have very high real interest rates and much lower uh, debts, you know, federal deficit to GDPs and debts to GDPs and run trade surpluses instead of trade deficits. And so I, I think that I know that almost all American investors are grossly underrepresented in emerging market debt. So I think in the bond market, it makes more sense to use kind of a barbell approach, which is quite a few short, short intermediate treasuries. Because there, I think you'll get hurt less. You're going to get, you know, you're not going to have the same hit to your pr principal if you do get a, you know, UK guilt kind of thing. You know, and then mix, mix that with uh, a lot of exposure to longer term emerging market debt. And a number of these closed end funds trade at a discount, which is a nice thing because those could actually go to a premium as they have in the past. So I, I think there's a way to play this peaking of global interest rates, but I don't think it's the long-term treasury market. Now, there's a lot of bright people that would disagree with me, like David Rosenberg, but I, th I think you just have to say this is different. We've never had the situation where the government's debt is absolutely blowing out. Deficits and debt are blowing out at a time of record low unemployment. That's telling us something's not operating as it did in the past. Well, so I we expect the same game... Sorry, go ahead. Something similar in the 1940s, though, um, kind of post World War II, or is it different in your opinion? Yeah, well, there were similarities in terms of having a very high debt to GDP. That part is true, but you know, you, we know why. It was because of you know beating Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. Uh, but then, of course, the deficit started coming down very rapidly, and part of that was because inflation ran hot, you know, for a few years, but. It wasn't like we have now where the deficits are, you know, were high and went higher. You know, the COVID's over, and yet we're we're running deficits that are basically, I mean, they're not quite as high, but they're they're unsustainably high. So it's it, that part's different. I mean, we got our, and then we had you know, the Korean War in 1950, and so deficits went up a little bit there. But in general, uh, deficits were, were largely under control, uh, you know, even really through the 1970s. And so by the end of the 70s, the federal debt to GDP was about 25% versus today it's 125%. And of course, the inflation of the, of the 1970s helped that. Uh, it was a process that had been underway really since the late 40s. But you know that's why Volcker could get interest rates up to 20% as the debt levels were low. We have, I mean, we would, I just don't see how the government can sustain 5% interest rates, much less eight or nine or 10. So the whole situation strikes me as just, you know, use that same word, unsustainable.
Yeah, I think we have a math problem. I totally agree. Japan has a math problem too. They're further along on this. I don't even think that they can afford a one or 2% increase in interest rates in Japan. I mean, they're talking about what a, a basis, a 20, 30 point basis, uh, some type of ban on the basis point, 20, 30% basis point increase. But I don't think they can afford a one or 2% increase. I think the US is not quite as far along in Japan on this, but is the US Treasury actually rolling over a lot of the debt uh, to longer term? Um, fixed rate debt? Because I, I thought they were most of the debt, many trillions of it that needed to be rolled over. I thought they were focusing on just short-term debt. Yeah, about 40% of the federal debt is going to come due in the next, you know, this year or next year. It's very short. That's another, you know, huge policy blunder was to not term out that debt when 10-year treasuries get down to 55 basis points in the summer of 2020. They didn't do that. So now this debt is going to be rolling over at very high interest rates. And apparently there is a, I don't know that it's a hard and fast requirement to keep the short maturities at, you know, short being a year or less at 20%, but that's what they tended to do is to not let it get over 20% and short debt. So they're you know pretty much maxed out there. And as a result, a lot of this new debt's going to have to be longer maturities. And that's, and there's, you, know, you don't have, I don't, especially with the, as you pointed out, the foreign central bar banks kind of on the sidelines and the, the U.S. banks, the domestic banks, uh, I mean, they've obviously been destroyed because of their exposure to U.S. treasuries, the duration risk of that. So they're not exactly enthusiastic buyers. And so that kind of leads U.S. households who've been big buyers, but they generally prefer shorter maturities. So it's going to be, I just I think we have the, the, a distinct possibility of a, a major some major indigestion in the bond market in the second half of this year that could look a lot like what happened to the UK gilt market a year ago or a year ago fall. So that's uh, And I do think we are kind of seeing this breakout or the threatened breakout above the peak that was hit last fall on US treasuries, which was about four and a quarter. And we're about 410 right now. We got to about 420 here a week before last during that announcement of the huge treasury financing needs. But it could easily scoot. And if we get up around 5% on the 10-year treasury, I think that's going to be a problem for not only the bond market, but for the stock market as well. And I think uh, the, if the Fed continues to raise interest rates, even if they stay higher for longer, the lag effects of that, I, I just see, the, re especially the regional banks, I just see lots and lots of problems with the regional banks. Um, a lot of the banks have not written off uh, mark to market losses on their bo older bond portfolio, commercial real estate losses, uh, small business loans going bad with the amount of bankruptcies, credit card debt, auto loans, what they've uh, a lot of the regional banks had tons of depositor capital leaving because if you're a depositor, why would you risk keeping your capital at a regional bank when you can go into money market funds or treasury direct or put it at a too big to fail bank? So I see just long list of problems here for the regional banks. And it sounds like from what you said that the U.S. federal government might change the laws and try to force the banks to buy even more treasuries. Well, yes, yeah, so that I do think is going to be an attempted solution at some point. Again, I'm not sure it's going to happen with Powell, although he's already made noises that they want to increase the capital buffers. It sounds like that's a prudent thing to do, but I think they're doing it more so that forces the banks to buy additional treasury debt, and they may well force them to do it in terms of non-interest bearing reserves, which would be obviously another hit to the banks, and I, I think is inherently inflationary. Uh, you know, you're basically creating more, you know, zero cost uh, short-term money, even though it's I guess you could say, well, it's, it's really good. If it's held in reserve, it's somewhat sterilized, but still it's just another way of debt monitor, another form of debt monetization, which is inherently inflationary. So yes, I think they're going to play all kinds of games to try to get this to happen. Uh, but again, I don't think Jay Powell is going to go along with it. I think he's, I was very critical of him up until the last year or so, because I thought he would fold like cheap lawn furniture last year when you know, you had the worst year combined for stocks and bonds since 1871. And previously in a mild bear market in 2018, he completely blinked and, you know, did the flip, but he stayed with it this time. And I think he's very concerned about his legacy and not going to just roll over and, and do things to help the financial markets or to allow fiscal dominance to happen on his watch. So that's that could be another you know, major standoff. I think ultimately he'll get replaced by somebody who's more politically pliable. 
But we've also got what could be an extremely chaotic presidential election coming up next year. So it just seems like there's, you know, these are these aren't risks that you and I are, are manufacturing out of some kind of conspiracy theory uh, machine. It's these are real valid problems that are bigger than we've ever seen in the past. I mean, particularly when it comes to the federal government's financial situation. And you brought up Japan, and it's true, they have a much higher debt federal government debt to GDP number than the US does. It's like 250 or maybe even closer to 300 percent But they do own it, owe it internally. And Japan's also a huge creditor country to the rest of the world, whereas we're now a huge debtor country. So we have to send money overseas. And of course, a lot of that is in the form of interest payments. So I mean, Japan's not exactly a great situation, but in some ways they have a lot less problems than we do. And they've also got an extremely undervalued currency. Well, they've actually had a pretty good amount of inflation lately compared to the past. So they uh, should be careful what they wish for. They've, they're getting more inflation than they want now. And now they're starting to lose control of their currency exchange rate. Uh, they said they were going to end Japanification. That didn't go so well. I think there was a surprise bond purchase that the Bank of Japan had to go in and do that they weren't planning on doing. So, I mean, they've been doing what financial repression and debt monetization, and they can't afford a uh, higher interest rates either because they've been doing the policy kind of that the Federal Reserve Bank copied since 2008, more or less. They've been doing that longer than the US has with a uh, yield curve control and financial repression. Right, and I think that is coming to an end. And what they've done is they've said, well, our new ceiling instead of half a percent on the 10-year Japanese government bond is now 1%, 100 basis points. And that's a that's a pretty big change. I mean, I don't think that's going to hold either. And, and you're right that at some point it becomes problematic for the government that has that much debt to have to start paying interest at that rate. I mean, even 2% on the kind of debt levels you're talking about gets to be you know, pretty cataclysmic, though, again, they're paying it internally. So it's the consumer, you know, probably what they're going to have to have at some point, just like I think we're going to have to have some kind of national estate tax that actually raises significant money from the boomer generation and even the older folks beyond, you know, there's still a, some of our parents left, the boomer parents left. And so there's going to be this massive transfer of assets between generations coming up. It's already happening. And I do think that it's pretty idiotic, these Western governments, because, you know, we, we do have a lot of wealth. And in our country, even if in the United States we have a lot of debt, but we have a lot of wealth and and that money should be, there should be a way to get some kind of a flat estate tax in place that generates a lot of revenue. Would, I think would have to go to a national solvency fund instead of just being squandered. Uh, you know, same thing with the value added tax. I think you got to have some really good guardrails. Otherwise, the, that money will just go down more rat holes. But anyway, that's I'm starting to wax a little too philosophical, but I, I do I guess my basic message is there are solutions. I mean, if Weimar Germany could get out of their fix in the early 20s, which they did after you know a tremendous amount of hyperinflation, but the US is in such better shape if we just had some policymakers that had a clue. Uh, unfortunately, I think a lot of people are short-term, greedy and corrupt in both political parties. And I, I think the policies are going to be similar to kind of how they force people to buy war bonds. Uh, I hope I'm wrong about this, but I could see policymakers kind of forcing people to buy um, long term U.S. treasuries and then the government basically just inflates the debt away. So they force people to put a small a certain percentage maybe to start with the camel gets its nose under the tent. You're forced to buy U.S. treasuries in your one of your retirement accounts, and then the government just starts inflating that treasury debt all, away. Historically, very similar to war debt. I think it's inevitable. I, I've been saying and writing for years as part of the, one of my main themes of Bubble 3.0, which we actually published in early 2022 before, you know, peak insanity really had popped or done, you know, the way of all flesh. And, you know, people tend to forget because we've had such a big rally this year, how horrible last year was. And it, as I said earlier, it really started toward the end of 2021. But, you know, I've been saying, I think bonds holder, bond holders are going to be the sacrificial lambs. And the government will do everything it can to make it seem like it's okay that it's you know we're we're using the same kind of policies that we did in the past, and I think it'll dupe a lot of people into you know playing the extension maturity extension game because it worked so well in the past. I mean, that was a forty year bond bull market that it ended. I'm convinced in the summer of 2020 when the long term treasury said earlier got down to 55 basis points, half a percent basically. 
So, yeah, I mean, maybe what they do is say, we'll let you buy the special government bond and not have to pay any taxes on them, like a, like a muni in effect. But then if you get locked in, you know, if it's a long term maturity at three or four percent and then inflation goes to six, seven, eight, you, you get crushed. And so they'll probably try to do some kind of carrot and stick type of thing to get that to happen. Yeah, I agree. This time is different because look at the interest payments on the debt. So the national debt's what, over $32 trillion now, and we're headed towards a trillion dollars per year just in interest payments. What that's um, already a top five line item expense for the U.S. federal government budget, and it could be top two once it gets towards a trillion. If you look at the line, I believe just recently the amount of money being spent on interest has exceeded the amount of money being spent on defense. For the first time, well, maybe it happened in the, the I doubt it happened in the 40s because the defense expenditures were enormous. It's a percentage of GDP. Yep, it's uh, crazy times. And I don't think crazy times mix well with a, a bull market, the market that's really at one of its most expensive valuations in history. If you look at price to sales, which I, I think is a really important way to value the market because profit margins are highly volatile and you can get a, a bit seduced or misled by uh, you know, peak profit margins. And Mike Wilson from Morgan Stanley said earnings quality is the worst it's been in 25 years. So it's not a bad idea to look at revenues, which are much less prone to manipulation. You know, as you were kind of mentioning, you know, accounting creativity. And, and if you do that, I mean, the market's more expensive than it was in 1999 at the peak of the tech bubble, which was the biggest bubble in U.S. equity market history, even greater than 1929. Yeah. So in terms of like regular stocks and small caps, the ones that are tech affiliated or the AI bubble, I'm staying away from that stuff. If I'm looking to buy something here for risk reward, I know we've had the oil rally, but I think there's a lot of bargains for cheap energy plays for uranium, oil, natural gas, coal. I think the fertilizer stocks are cheap because there's been shortages of crops. So I think farmers will start to order fertilizer again. So I think the commodities are going to eventually have a nice rally in the not too distant future. Yes, we like the fertilizer stocks. We'd love the energy stocks when they corrected, but they've had a heck of a run. I put out a table pounding uh, haymaker on, I think it was June 15th, right around there, which I normally I've been saying buy slowly because I think we're still in a bear market. But I mean, the energy stocks just looked unbelievably cheap at that point. But again, big rally. So it's, it's harder to find bargains. There's still some out there. But um uh, yeah, I think in general, this is a time to be, you know, raising some cash and being prepared for the next down leg. Yeah, cash, gold, um, just uh, avoiding U.S. Treasuries. <laughs> kind of if if some people are repeating whatever Jim Cramer says about how, like, it's easy just buy seven stocks. It's easy just buy U.S. Treasuries. That kind of makes me uh, scared because the oil price, what's... Um, only a couple months ago, we had the largest, most overcrowded trade by hedge funds. There was a record amount of net shorts, net short oil futures contracts. And I was just warning saying like, look, when there's this this many uh, trend traders, uh, hedge fund trend traders that are short oil futures contracts, they're going to eventually have to cover. They're wrong. We're seeing what Valero and the refiners say, demand for gasoline strong. We're starting to see all these signs and people like, oh, no, uh, recession, depression, Oil demand is going to collapse, and now look what's happened in the last two months. Oh, believe me, I thought that you know through most of this year, saying that you know my two wild predictions were in the next recession, oil prices would go up, and so would long interest rates. And now, I, you know, we can't say that we're actually in recession yet, but uh, yeah, that idea that you were exactly right. I mean, there was tremendous bearishness. That's one of the points we made in our table pounder haymaker from back in June was the super bearish position. We ran a chart saying, look, if you had bought oil or oil stocks, energy stocks, every time you had this kind of negative sentiment over the last 15 years, you would have made money every single time. And so yeah, that's that's one of the that's one of the best indicators. Uh, you know, when when everybody is really bullish, you generally want to be bearish or at least taking some profits and vice versa. But unfortunately, I think humans by nature tend to be trend followers. We'd like to run with the herd. You know, we learned as we evolved over, you know, the last hundred thousand years or so that we want to, to move in a herd. It's safer. But in the financial markets, the herd, I mean, it, it, for a while it works. That's just kind of the history of it. But then, you know, when it gets carried to an extreme, as it always does, that's when really bad things happen. 
Well, also the oil market fundamentals were very different than what was happening with the oil price. I mean, there was a lot of oil being dumped with the strategic petroleum reserve and then the short positions on the oil futures contract. That wasn't jiving with the stuff I was looking at for the supply and demand fundamentals. OPEC was talking about cutting supply further. You were seeing um, a lot of the oil service companies saying, hey, we're not getting contracts onshore to, to drill a lot of new wells. The rig count in the US was coming down. And then demand numbers uh, were actually better than expected. So all these things, and then the oil bears were just saying, doesn't matter, doesn't matter, recession, demand's going to collapse. So they were saying like, uh, because of price action and the, they weren't, they were like, oh, the strategic petroleum reserve sales don't have anything to do with the oil price. And I was like, okay, go and look uh, at a chart of when the strategic petroleum reserve oil sales stopped. And that's about when the oil rally started. Right. I'm totally <laughs> with you. Uh, there's, there was a lot of misinformation, and part of the problem is the IEA, which is the main authority, has been so wrong for so many years. I mean, going back to the late 90s when they were sued for putting out bad data, and they haven't been sued this time, but they've had to do these massive 100 million up barrel revisions, mostly increased demand, and uh, that's almost exclusively from the developing world. And that's part of the problem is they don't have good data on developing world demand. So a lot of the data that you know these government entities put out are are wrong and misleading, and frankly, I think that's what we're seeing with some of this GDP and employment. I mean, I think that's you know that's really got a lot of people fooled as they look at the official labor numbers, or unemployment numbers, and they're not realizing how much that's influenced by the birth death model, and that gets to be a little esoteric, but just suffice to say that it's it's pretty clear that the official jobs numbers are being overstated right now. Oh, I 100% agree. So they they count um, part-time jobs, these gig economy jobs as full-time jobs. They're counted the same. But then, like you said, with the birth death model, you have over 100,000 jobs per month. And in a month, two months, three months later, there's always a revision downward. But the algorithms that trade the stock market don't uh, care about the revisions that occur after the headline numbers. Yeah, it's like what we we're saying about oil. That's exactly right. And people trade off these early numbers, which invariably get revised. And it's all kind of silly, but eventually reality bites. Well, I, I really enjoyed our discussion today, David. I think I could talk to you for another couple hours and just have <laughs> a, a great discussion. I don't know if our listeners would want to listen to that for a couple more hours. I don't think so. <laughs> but but I could definitely do it. So we'll have to have you back on again in the not too distant future next couple months. If my listeners want to check out your sub stack or follow your work, how do they do so? Again, go to uh, Haymaker underscore Substack is probably the official way to do it, but I, I think Haymaker Substack works just fine. And I guess I put a little plug in there because we have this, uh, we have gone paid with most of our content, not all. We still have free content up there, but uh, you know, I'm especially uh, favorable towards our founding member status because it's a pretty intensive suite. And this is not for, you know, not for people that just kind of dally in the financial markets. This is for serious people because a lot of a lot of our readers. Frankly, if they don't run all their own portfolios, they run a lot of it. So they might have a manager, but they don't fully trust that manager. So or they're using index vehicles and they, they want to have some guidance. So this is really for the more serious folks, but I think it's a it's a pretty darn good bargain for how much you get. So put a little bit of a plug in there for that. But in general, uh, yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of content available. At, at, it's certainly a very, very affordable price.